Testing, one, two, all right. Great. Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Keith St. Clair. I teach political science here at Grand Rapids Community College, and uh, it's my pleasure on behalf of the Social Science Department to welcome you to our annual Race, Ethnicity, and Identity Conference. And it's particularly my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Dylan Carr, professor of anthropology, who will be speaking on um, invisible walls, the uh, ethnic and identity uh, barriers that exist here in Grand Rapids. And uh, I've gotten to know Dylan over the last couple years. He is relatively new to our department and our college, but he has quickly uh, developed a reputation uh, for being an engaging and uh, enlightening speaker. And I am certainly proud to call him my colleague. And uh, it is my hope that he will continue to be here at Grand Rapids Community College for a long time. So um, with no further ado, I'd like to welcome and, uh, and invite you to applaud our, for our speaker, Dr. Gillen Carr. Thank you, Keith. Is this loud enough on here? Good. Awesome. Um, and also, thank you for the wonderful introduction and for uh, browbeating your class and bringing them here. So um, it feels like I got a full audience. And then, uh, so I, I forced my own class to come here. Keith forced his class. I think Professor Vujic forced his class as well. So this is how we get people to listen to us, really. Um, and while I had a captive audience, I've always joked that what I should start doing is selling advertising space for my lecture slides. So I don't know how that works, but I figured I can advertise my own stuff. So I'm going to shamelessly plug anthropology classes here at GRCC. Space is limited. Sign up now. Uh, That's your bank account number, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How's that? You're on A little bit louder? Yeah. I have no singing voice whatsoever, so. <laughs> Actually, I get a little clip of Professor Williams singing in a second, so uh, that'll, be, that'll be good. Uh, the, the impetus for this talk really came out of, of the Race and Ethnicity Conference last year in, in 2012, uh, which is my first time participating in the Race and Ethnicity Conference, both as a, a presenter um, and also as a, a sort of a recipient of it, going to listen to my colleagues uh, present different uh, sort of, of aspects from their body of research. And that's really why I love things like this and also being in, in such a wonderfully um, sort of diverse department in terms of disciplinariness. So at different places that you go, you'll, you'll be just hanging around anthropologists and you talk about anthropological things and you really tend to f really con converse yourself into a box. But the great thing about being here at GRCC is I have colleagues from really all over the social science spectrum, so I'm able to have conversation with them, go to their talks, and, and this is kind of where um, this particular presentation grew out of. Um, in, in particular, um, Professor Virgix and Professor uh, Cedric Williams' uh, talks last year kind of got me thinking um, in terms of ways in which uh, social boundaries are, are maintained and developed and persist um, within different communities in that. And so um, I took that from the Race and Ethnicity Conference last year and then I kind of worked it into one of my lectures. And so over the past year of all my anthropology classes, uh, we've touched upon this subject. And I'm pretty new to Grand Rapids. So it was really nice having uh, so many students over the last couple semesters um, sort of filling in some of the, the ideas and, and, and their observations about really the, the community around them that they have been, um, or yourselves, have been born and raised within. And so uh, the co-authors, I guess, on this presentation are every one of my anthropology students for the last sort of year with, with that as well. Um, so where one of the ideas that, that first came about was, uh, let me see if I can get this to work here. <laughs> Professor Vrujic's talk uh, about immigration. Morning. <laughs> and the ways in which nations try to resolve this problem of outsiders coming into the, their communities to build walls. Right? Nations build walls. Some uh, nations build walls not only around uh, their borders, but also some nations build walls within their cities right? to separate one community from other. Let me, let me show. I don't know. I like walls. So <laughs> I put, uh, how many of you like walls? Anybody likes walls? Hmm? Like doors better, gates. <laughs> yeah, this, this is this is one of my favorite walls. Right? 
I like walls too. And so obviously I stole the title of this talk from that little uh, segment in there in terms of thinking about walls. And um, what Professor Verzik was talking about specifically was barriers between flows of, of human capital from nations and nations. In other words, putting up walls for, for immigration, but even within countries, separating out uh, differences between people that, that um, have national citizenship from those that don't have national citizenship. Um, and that really sort of got me thinking in terms of, of um, applying an anthropological perspective to thinking about walls here in, in the, the community of Grand Rapids. And Professor Cedric Williams' talk, um, right towards the end of it, he offered some really sort of more personal commentary that I thought was an excellent insight into some of the, the sort of the lived experience that different members of this community have and how we, we tend to move about and how we tend to restrict ourselves uh, differently within uh, really the city of Grand Rapids. Uh, William Julius Wilson, who I do know, uh, also went to uh, my alma mater, Northwestern, and we were talking one day and he said, you know, he said, when I went to school, the perception was quite different. We didn't have affirmative action, he said, during his day. The perception was, when he's in school, he had to be good to get there. For me, you're here because we need a quota. Do you see where I'm going? So now people want to move on. You've, we've done enough. We've dealt with this long enough. We don't deal with it anymore. It's done with. Everybody is treated equally. We live in a colorblind society. Right. So why is it that, uh, let's see, Myers, Walgreens, uh, Family Fair, et cetera, doesn't provide or carry all of the African-American hair products that, do you see where I'm going? Why don't they carry that? I'm one of their patrons. I go to Walgreens. I go to D&W, Family Fair. Why don't they carry my products? Encourage me to shop there. They want me to go to Hair Joy. <laughs> When's the most racist time? Sunday morning. So we separate on Sunday morning. I go to church, and there are all African Americans in the church, and the choir comes in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? Now, when I go to another section of town, and it's non-white, and then we're all with the choir and the hymnal, etc. Why do we do that? That's a great question. Why do we do that? Uh, and Professor Williams has got a much better voice than I do, so uh, at least we let him to, to bring the melody to this. But why do we do that? Um, and really, when we think about that from an anthropological perspective, there's an entire body of research regarding the idea of ethnicity, the idea of, of other social constructs such as race and social class. Um, and really what it boils down to essentially is these ideas of us versus them. That's why we do that, um, in the sense that all of us have to have a sense of collective belonging. That's how we anchor our identity of who we think we are, who we relate with, and what we have a tendency to do is interact with those people that share our backgrounds, our views, um, that tend to think like us, to act like us, to behave like us, to share our same interests like us. Um, that's what we do, and there's nothing inherently wrong with that. You might as well enjoy what, what you're doing, um, and, and so on. However, there's always sort of the implications of that is when you're sort of, of forming an identity of who you are, by definition, you have to exclude somebody who is not you. And that becomes sort of the, the tension in which all of us essentially live our lives within, is that we go through in defining our attitudes, our behaviors, our identities, and a sense of collecting belonging to the categories that we form ourselves into, the social roles that we see ourselves occupying. But in the process of defining ourselves, we also define what really the, the anthropological literature characterizes as the other. Who are we not? And regardless is what you end up is this tension between us and them. Um, you have a very positive sense of self. You have a positive sense of your collective identity of who you are and where you go and who you interact with. But by default, you exclude somebody. Um, and that really becomes a, one of those, those difficult tensions that's in there. And so um, a lot of this body of, of research that looks at social categories and interaction between groups of people focuses on the other. Um, and who is the other in that sense? Uh, well, um, 
pretty much any of the box that you can ever check on a form is one way of categorizing both yourself and any other unchecked boxes becomes the other. Um, another really good way to pick up who is the other is this listen to how people talk about other people. Um, and if they don't use their name, if they don't put a personalized space on it, and they use more generalizing terms such as those people, that's somebody who you're not. And those people become the other. They're essentially a faceless entity who is less than what you are. Why don't they just behave like I do? Or what are they thinking? Um, every time I hear people use those words and those terms, I always like to challenge them. Who are they? Well, that's usually where I get the awkward explanation. Or somebody talking about those people. Well, who are those people? What are their names? Where do they go to school? What do they do for a living? What are their interests? Um, and it gets pretty clear that the other is any group of people that you really lack any very, very direct personal experience with. Because if you have a personal lived experience with a group of people, you don't explain to them or talk to them in characteristics such as the other. You talk about who they are as individuals. Um, and that's inherently at the root um, of some of these issues in terms of how we characterize our identity and exclude other people. Um, and the classic, uh, I think, social theorist, Dr. Seuss, um, I'm stealing this from Matthew uh, Richards, who is a, a professor of anthropology at Valdosa State University. And he reads this to his class. But um, I don't have enough copies of the books to get away with this. But um, the Sneetches. Anybody remember reading the Sneetches in, in sort of a, a young grade? Uh, what, what's, what's the characteristic of the Sneetches? What was the, the main point? Yeah, they're different. So you have the star-bellied Sneetches, and then you have the plain-bellied Sneetches. And the star belly Sneetches go hang out at the beach all day. They're walking around. They're playing with the, their balls and, and sort of, of playing uh, sort of catch and that kind of stuff. And what they continually do is every time a flat-bellied Sneetch wants to play around with the star belly Sneetch, they ignore him. Um, they instruct their kids to, to not talk to the flat belly Sneetches because they're not a star belly Sneetch. Um, and so the star becomes a metaphor for a visual marker of one's social category um, in that sense. And what you see throughout the entire book of Dr. Seuss is this tension between a category of us um, from the perspective of the star-bellied Sneetches and the category of the other who is characterized of the flat belly or clean belly Sneetches in that regard. Um, it becomes a wonderful good metaphor for the ways in which we interact and move through the society that all of us inhabit in that regard. Um, going the wrong way. So one of the, the prevalent categories that, um, that we focus on and, and, and work through oftentimes is gets lumped underneath this broad category of ethnicity, um, which is a, a wonderfully horrendous term on one hand and a wonderfully valued term on the other hand. Um, and one thing I pose to, to all of my classes this semester in the very first day of class, I make them take tests the first day of class, um, is ask them to define the characteristics of ethnicity. So just take for a, a second here and just think through this in terms of what you consider to be the most valued elements of, of ethnicity. And so rank these one, two, three, four, five. So give one to what you think is the most, most likely or most strong conditioner of ethnicity, and five being the least. Take like one second to do that. And then turn to the person next to you and compare your lists. Or you could take tests quicker in my class. <laughs> All right, how many of you had the same list? So two people had the same list. Uh, don't feel bad. Everybody gets this question wrong. So <laughs> this is a sample of some of the responses I got from my, my anthropology classes in the very first day of the semester. What's the pattern here, do you think? There isn't a pattern. And this is usually how it ends up turning out, is it's all over the map. Because all of us struggle with putting down a precise idea of what we really think ethnicity actually is. Because it's such a fluid concept. And it's intentionally so. There's so many different aspects and things that allow us to think about and work through this issue of ethnicity. And it's all grounded in your experience. But there's not a single other person in this room that shares your experience the same. Which is why, when you turn to the person next to you, you don't come up with the same list. If you've grown up in a, a relatively homogenous community, where everybody looks like you, thinks like you, talks like you, 
you have a tendency to envision ethnicity or the other in terms of something that's distant, removed in both time and space. And so for you, what you tend to emphasize are geography and history as those dimensions of ethnicity because those are the things that you read about um, in the news when it talks about faraway lands and ethnic conflicts there. And so geography becomes a determinant of it. Or it's something that we've done in the past but no longer so because it doesn't impact you in terms of your daily life because you move through networks that are essentially identical to yourself. If you have a different set of experiences where ideas of religion become important, then those become a much more valued uh, component of ethnicity. Or if you're somebody who experiences either being out of place in terms of a more of a heterogeneous community, or if you're somebody who feels language barriers have some sort of impact on your life, um, or skin color becomes a much more strong determinant in terms of your particular lived experience, then these creep up as the higher determinants of ethnicity. And so all of you are right, and that's the point behind ethnicity. It's intentionally vague and fluid, but it's grounded in experience, and it's reproduced, not in static, but through how all of us actually behave. That's how we produce and reproduce ethnicity, and it's a lived thing that's always ongoing. It's an always emergent process in that sense. You have to continually affirm your ethnic identity, um, but the process of doing so is also creates the other, of somebody who you're not. And so you can never really get away from this essential tension with how we all move through. And so ethnicity itself has a horribly broad term. And if you ask 15 anthropologists to define ethnicity, you're probably going to get 15 different um, definitions of it uh, because it is intentionally vague. So the more productive analytical approach then becomes, what are the characteristics of how ethnicity operates? Have you ever questioned, like, why do we even have ethnicity in the first place? What's the point of it? To separate. Yeah, it helps make sense of the variability in the world around you. So that's one way in which ethnicity operates. In a more positive way, why would we have an ethnic identity that we feel strongly about? What does that do? Heritage. Heritage. And it helps tie your roots to something else. Um, we have a tendency to really ignore the, the valued purpose of this in here in Western state level societies because so much of the regulatory roles within our culture are regulated by essentially non-kin, non-family, non-kin, or non-ethnic based federal and state and local governments. Uh, we don't have to worry about building trust for a business venture because we have trust that we can just go to a court system and have that resolved in our favor. But regions of the world where you see ethnic identities that are very profound and heavily marked and a lot of ethnic conflict comes from, People use ethnicity as a regulatory role within their societies. You can go across your country and set up a business relationship with somebody you do not know, even in a country that doesn't have a court system that can regulate or give you a legal action, say that falls apart, but you have trust that will go through because the person you're going to do business with is not just anybody. The person that you'll do business with is somebody that shares your ethnic background. And because there's something that ties you together, that heritage that ties you together, you have a degree of trust. And so it serves a, a very val valued role in that one sense, which is to promote inclusion, to tie people together. Um, but as Sean pointed out at the end of it, it also tends to create those boundaries and exclude the other people um, by that mere practice of it. What ways do we promote group solidarity through um, ethnic um, identities in our society? or some of the ways that you've, you've promoted inclusion? Not between groups, but within groups. Having a group on campus, like a graduate program? Yeah, you have a defined group that the membership is rigid. Um, and you basically perform that collective identity together by belonging to the same organization. That's great. Or some other ways you do that. Festivals are a great one. Uh, it seems like every other weekend in this town, there's a Polish festival, isn't there? <laughs> <like> great. <laughs> and what happens when you go to, to Holland in, in, was it May? <laughs> Tulip time, or as everybody's calling it, STEM Fest last year because we had too much warm weather. We like to perform our identity. We like to celebrate it. We just had St. Patrick's Day, 
which is an expression of Irish heritage. We have tulip time, which is an expression of uh, Dutch heritage. Uh, we have various Pol Polosky days, which would be an expression of Polish heritage. Festivals became a very, very profound way that we can promote that, that idea of solidarity between individuals. Uh, you share languages together. A lot of ethnic groups um, help maintain their strong sense of collective identity by preserving language use in different contexts. Uh, you form collective organizations together, as pointed out, to help reform your idea of collectiveness. And so every single ethnic group or everything really social category out there promotes a strong sense of collective self through these strategies of inclusion. And what ends up emerging out of that is really what we often define as imagined communities. Uh, Benedict Anderson was a, a theorist that's widely credited as, as being uh, responsible for coining the, the concept of imagined communities. And what he did was really define that in terms of national identity. And nationalism really is an ethnic identity, so to speak, in all ways, shapes, and form. We all in this room, presumably other than a few uh, Canadians that might be in here, share the same sense of collective ethnic identity as Americans. Uh, we have a shared history. We have a shared geography, which is the border. We have a way to promote group solidarity in terms of citizenship. What festivals do we have to, to celebrate our ethnic, ethnicity? Fourth of July, Memorial Day. We celebrate all sorts of things. And so we do all the same inclusive strategies as nations do. And nations operate as imagined communities in the same way that that's what makes ethnicity persist is because it has a functional purpose within society. It has a valued regulatory role to some extent because it ties us together in very, very profound, important, and very, very strong ways that uh, I cannot understate that enough, I guess. And one of the characteristics of an imagined community is that it's limited and it's sovereign. There has to be a boundary. Us and them, in that sense. Uh, and nations do this by actually putting surveyed borders. Uh, I don't know where I stole this from, but um, I always be confused with this person. You go to your kitchen, you become Canadian, you come back to your living room, you're American. Um, it's probably in like upstate Maine or something like that. Um, or you can separate East and West Germany um, at a particular point in history by erecting a wall, uh, which Gordon likes walls more than, than I do um, in that sense. It's limited. Membership is exclusive, and membership is defined, and it's regulated, and all of us have this idea of citizenship that ties together. And the same thing that ethnicity has a limited membership. Uh, you don't have a a card that defines your ethnicity, although some places do. But for the most part, it's how you perform your identity and who you think you are that helps you anchor your citizenship of within your collective ethnic identity in that sense. And what that does then is it promotes and it creates an imagined sense of camaraderie that ties us all together. Has anybody here from, that's an American traveled outside of the States before and bumped into another American? What's that experience like? Anybody got a really good story with that one? Yeah, you get so excited. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> For those of you who haven't traveled outside the States, have you ever left Michigan and bumped into somebody else from Michigan? What's the first thing you do? I'm from the UP, so it's always an awkward moment. I'm like, I don't know where on there that is. And so then you have to put your other hand up there. Um, and I feel excluded then. It's like, we're going to take our bridge and go home. Um, yeah, you feel tired. And so you're like, oh, you're from Michigan too? That's great. Where are you from? Flint. And then what you try to do is you figure out that one person in Flint that both of you know. <laughs> do you know such and such? No. Exactly. <laughs> or if you're outside traveling out of America and you haven't spoken English or uh, really sort of a, a started to experience culture shock, um, and you're coming through and you bump into another American, and you're like, man, this is awesome. Where are you from? And you're like, New Mexico. That's awesome. <laughs> I haven't talked to another American. Uh, have you bumped into other Croatians here in the States? I just like to escape from them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's an American thing, I guess. <laughs>
but that's an imagined camaraderie. Although there's 310 million Americans, so you have no really chance in a million to even know all Americans. But regardless if you know them, regardless if you share any interests alike, whether you share any common background alike, you could be from different generations and ages or anything like that. But the, by virtue of them being part of the same ethnic identity in the sense American, you feel instant connection with them. It doesn't matter where they're from, who they are, or if you're never ever going to talk to them again. That's what an imagined community provides for you. And that's why ethnicity is probably one of the most powerful social constructs that we have um, really in the world today. That's why people really will go to violence and do violence upon other people is over this idea um, of camaraderie. It is powerful, and I can't understate that enough. And so just think back to your experiences of bumping into somebody that shares the same collective ethnic identity view outside of that context and the excitement that you feel, that sense of co connectedness that you feel. And that's the power of an imagined community. Where does it come from? Well, we all shared so many experiences like. All of you were forced to take history classes. Some of you were forced to take anthropology classes. Uh, who is this guy right here? What's he doing? He's going to go kick the Hessians out of New Jersey, and we overthrew our colonial overmasters, and we get to be Americans. Uh, and if he chops down a cherry tree, what do you do? You don't tell a lie. <laughs> or we have this idea of the founding of America is when the Mayflower bumped into a, a big continent on its way to somewhere else. And then um, they had a great uh, sort of Thanksgiving with the Native American peoples there. And then they lose sight of them in the history books. Uh, because we share the same collective sense of history, right or wrong, we share the same collective sense of our values as Americans. Uh, and those help tie us together. So when you bump into another American, who might have grown up entirely across the other side of a continent, you still feel camaraderie with them because you both share the same public school experiences. You still are consumers of the same media that talk about things that happen on a world scale. A tsunami hit over here, and all these people died, and three Americans' planes were delayed, is what we talk about. Or how does it affect us from our perspective? And so you filter all of the world experiences through this homogenized sense of American media. And what that does is tie you together with everybody else that belongs to that same category of person. That's an imagined community and how they form and how they're maintained and how they persist. And every time you celebrate 4th of July, which here in Grand Rapids apparently means shooting off fireworks by my apartment like for three months on end. <laughs> uh, but every time you celebrate that, you're reaffirming your collective camaraderie together as an imagined community. And that's an example of something we can all ground into. But every single ethnic identity out there in the world today and in the past, present, and future functions as an imagined community. In that. And so if on one hand, we promote ideas of inclusion among members of our, our group uh, through solidarity and festivals and all these other little recursive practices that promote that camaraderie, by definition, you have to exclude the other. Because you need to know who you're not. Which is why we have plenty of Canadian jokes out there, which helps us separate ourselves from Canada. Um, here in Michigan, we have plenty of Ohio jokes, uh, which separates us from Ohio um, in that sense. <laughs> and it depends on whether you go to Michigan State or Michigan helps sort of separate yourselves as well. Um, I got to exchange my password, too. <laughs> and this is where it kind of gets to the title of the talk. Those strategies that sometimes are intentional, but more often than not are completely unintentional consequences of doing and performing our identity tends to exclude <laughs> other people. Um, and what that does is form boundaries between us and them, or like I like to characterize as invisible walls. And so one of the things I've been posing to my classes for the last couple semesters is, what sorts of walls or boundaries do we have here in Grand Rapids? Um, and this is where the class is remarkably astute in terms of understanding a social landscape. They might not intuitively know until they spell it out, but everybody realizes the types of walls they have. And one of the, the most common ones that comes out first and foremost is school. What school do you go to? Um, where did you go to school? Who do you interact with in that school? And that has a profound 
effect because as I like to ask the question, raise your hand if you have a very, very close childhood friend from a different school system than you. Some people, we have other sort of activity, but others don't, don't really. That's your primary means of interacting in terms of forming your base social network and that you move through your social network. Raise your hand if you ever got a job because you knew a school friend. That's the value of those social networks right there. Uh, this is what uh, the ancestral background of Grand Rapids public school system students are uh, in terms of ideas of race and ethnicity. Uh, and what we see here is on this end of the column, we have schools that are predominantly people of European American ancestry. Uh, we have the green line, which is schools of predominantly African American ancestry, uh, Latino. Uh, what we see over here are schools that are almost exclusively one group or another group. And on this end is another part of the school. But GRPS is not doing too bad. We got a huge number of ones right here in the middle uh, that have some sort of, of integrated sense of school and forming those networks that will cut across sort of ancestral or ethnic lines in that regard, which is great. Uh, although then the question becomes, are these schools equal? Is Camp Hope Park Elementary the same as North Park Elementary? Um, and you can look at some very simple economic data to show that as the percentage of white students go up, so does the, the percentage of free and reduced lunch goes down. So these are very, very different school systems on the edges over here, but we still have a large number that are in the middle as well. So this is one of the, the stories of the landscape. But I kept looking at this. And so I, I downloaded this data from the National Education Statistics Center. I kept looking at it, and it's like, this looks good. But something just seemed off. It didn't seem like the numbers were right. Uh, there's a reason why oftentimes people use the term minority is because numerically, they are less. Yet we seem to have far more minority students in GRPS. So I'm like, is it just because the demographic composition of Grand Rapids as a city is different? So you look at the demographic data for the city, and that's not, in fact, the case, that there are demographically more uh, people of European ancestry in the city. So then I started asking myself, where are all the white kids at? <laughs> and so if I download the same set of database, which is private schools within the city of Grand Rapids, I get a much different picture of what school is like of what social networks are being formed at that moment in time. These are all just elementary schools because people will willingly travel further for high school. But your base social network, and so if I combine all public, private, and charter schools in the city of Grand Rapids, I'm not talking about Wyoming, Forest Hills, or anything like that, or even East Grand Rapids, what we see are two different worlds. There's an invisible wall somewhere right down in here that keeps two or three groups of people from interacting with one another. Not because people are going out of their way. I'm not going to begrudge any single parent for sending their kids to a private school. That's a decision that you're going to invest in your child. It's a great decision. What I'm illustrating is the unintended consequence of that decision is that's putting a boundary between you and somebody else. And that's kind of the point of this talk, is just to make you aware of these invisible walls that you will erect in the world around you in that sense. So we have school systems. We see the value of those. What goes along with this, obviously, is neighborhoods. And one of the reasons why I selected elementary school data is that is, is probably a much better idea of the relative dispersal of different neighborhoods within the city of Grand Rapids. Because you tend to go to elementary school very, very close to home. We don't like to let five-year-old kids walk across town. So uh, well, what about neighborhoods? So this is some of the most recent census data. Uh, and what we see is if you're classified as, as black within the, the census form. What we have is, is a strong cluster here. You have a, a much more sort of even distribution. But it still has a firm boundaries to where your neighborhoods typically are. And so if you're black and you're a Grand Rapids resident, you're more than likely to grow up in these neighborhoods here. Um, and slightly different are the Hispanic or Latino communities, um, which are slightly over there. Um, and then this is a hor horrible one to see, but we use the same coloring for people of European ancestry. So if you're black and Latino in here, fear not, us white people have you surrounded. <laughs> and you can see the areas that are there. Um, I illustrate that somewhat jokingly, but in all seriousness, what that does is create boundaries between you and somebody else because there's this habit of how many of you have a good close childhood friend that grew up across the town from you? 
Raise your hand. A few people. How many of you ever got a job because you knew a neighborhood somebody or somebody in your neighborhood? Again, you form these social networks, and those social networks have value. But if your social network is going to be largely constrained by the neighborhoods that you grow up in and interact with, then obviously you have a boundary between yourself and somebody else. And that somebody else is what we like to call the other. And then what usually comes up in class lectures, so we touch upon the two big ones, which is geographic distribution and primary school systems. And then this is where I love my students because they basically come up with all these wonderful, insightful things that I'm like, man, I never thought of that. Um, and things that they articulate is all the different little nuanced myriad of ways that we interact differently and how we move through this town differently that separate ourselves from other people that we aren't even aware of because we have a tendency to try to do habitual actions. How many of you love to do just your daily routine over and over and over and over and over again? We all find ourselves doing that. Um, so who do you choose to live with? Where do you choose to live? Where do you choose to shop? Where do you go to eat? Where do you meet a friend? How do you move through the city of Grand Rapids? All has an effect upon your experiences. Uh, this is a, a close up of uh, the city of Grand Rapids. We are right about here. So this is Fulton Street, Wealthy Street. This is East Grand Rapids. Uh, Division Avenue is down here. College, Eastern, Fuller. And what this is is a map of the demographic data of uh, percentage uh, black within the, the uh, most recent census. And we can see what often every, every one of my students is able to articulate is the predominantly core black community here in Grand Rapids, which is south of Wealthy, um, west of Fuller, between Fuller and Division. I forget what the cross street down there is, but all of you can depict that. Um, and this obviously is, is East Grand Rapids. What I'm interested in is these boundary areas. Now, I'm selecting this particular boundary because it's, it, uh, it's very, very distinctive. Uh, there's much more fluid boundaries in other parts of the city of Grand Rapids um, that are a little harder, but I don't want to bore you with a bunch of statistical data. They just take the most prevalent one and show you the difference there. How do you maintain a boundary like this that is rigid, where you walk two blocks one direction and you enter into an entirely different community? How do you maintain that boundary? Housing prices, absolutely. So this is median economic data, and obviously you can't afford to move into certain neighborhoods by based on housing prices as well. Um, and there's a tendency for people to want to live near their family, and if their family grew up one place, you have a tendency to go and try to buy a house anywhere near there, even if you can afford a house elsewhere. There is that tendency for that. And so this economic data, which is completely inverted to the demographic data, is really a reflection of your ability to buy a house in different neighborhoods. And so that's one very, very profound way in which we keep boundaries intact within different communities as well. Uh, another way we do that is in terms of movements through um, the larger region or, or social landscape of, of Grand Rapids. And so again, our, our demographic data, and then a map of the bus lines. Very few of you probably take the bus to school more of you probably take the bus to school. How many of you take the bus to work, to school, to the grocery store, to visit family, to visit friends? Uh, to transport yourself across a town through a bus line? Uh, I've done it numbers of times, which I always love to do because um, it beats trying to drive in traffic, and I hate traffic. But if you're restricted to the bus line because you can't afford an automobile, that restricts your access to what types of jobs you can apply for how to get to the job, which types of classes you select here at GRCC. Because if you have to work down at 28th Street, and you have to take the bus between work and a class, you don't get to enroll in the full suite selection of courses here at GRCC because you can't take a class at 2 o'clock because you need the hour and a half to be on the bus to get down there for work at 4 o'clock or 3 o'clock. So it restricts access and it restricts your interaction through town. We can see the, the relationship between the bus line and the dispersal of groups of different ancestry through the Grand Rapids city. Your movements are different. Uh, you get to select different things and go to different places. Uh, you can afford to move out to the periphery and then commute in. You can afford to pick and choose what stores you want to go to shop to. Uh, 
one of the, the sort of the, the lingering themes that have emerged out of this is the mire on 28th Street, uh, the Cascade Mire just past the freeway, uh, which I like to call fake town mire because they built a little facade to make it look like a fake town, uh, which the bus line doesn't run out there. And so one of my students once remarked that whenever she goes to that, that mire with her mother, her mother feels compelled to, to put on a little nicer clothes to go there because you're now into a different social landscape versus going to the mire on Kalamazoo Avenue where you have a different experience of who you're interacting with on a daily basis. That's an invisible wall, is which, even which mire you have access to will dictate who you're gonna interact with and how you're gonna perceive that interaction and what your lived experience is gonna be like. And if you don't have a lived experience that transports yourself across a boundary, you're left in the reign of ignorance. And that's partly where a lot of the problems of the other comes from what classes you take, what school you go to, um, which elementary school you go to is dictated by that, as we see with the school statistics, your shopping choices, your housing choices. Uh, one of the things that sort of jumped out at me when, um, when you plot the, the number of uh, people of European ancestry was this block right in here, which is Granville, uh, which is remarkably like 95% white. Uh, and it seemed a little odd that it was this, that Sprung up. One, the bus line runs there, and two, uh, the areas around it have roughly a, a 15 to 20 percent uh, composition of, of most minority peoples. Um, and it was my lovely wife that actually pointed this out to me, which was there's no rental units in Granville. And so I ran that against the, the database that we have here for owner occupied housing, and Granville is on the extreme in terms of above 95 percent owner occupied housing. And so you create separation by yourself by having access to a particular house or having access to housing and you really can't emerge into a new community unless there's options of affordable housing for that um, and those of you who might be looking at home ownership that's a different set of questions than looking for a stable apartment that you can move into or even an affordable house that you can rent for yourself and your family uh, those decisions are fine select and move to wherever you want and wherever is going to give you the most advantage but what I want to illustrate to you is that decision ends up creating a barrier between yourself and other people unintentionally. And that's what I mean by an invisible wall, is those are the ones that come up that we're never even aware of, but they have a really a profound effect um, onto to oneself. Um, any other walls you can think of? The highways that you can't walk across. Highways you can't walk across, absolutely. Um, I'm even scared to drive on the belt line. <laughs> let alone sort of, of walk across it um, in that regard. And the freeways themselves will, will create that. We had a really great conversation in my 210 class yesterday um, regarding sporting interests um, in that we had a number of snowboarders in class. And snowboarding, you really have to have a certain degree of, of access to ski hills and equipment and that versus maybe other sporting sort of interests that might be soccer or across and that you tend to get divergence in terms of, of even those types of, of daily interests uh, and really it's every one of your recursive practices and by recursive I mean just your average mundane daily things what you do in day in and day out and day in and day out and day in and, day, and when you do it habitually you're never even consciously aware of what you're doing but those actions wall you off from the rest of Grand Rapids as a larger community uh, even little things like, I love coffee. Um, and the, the idea of coffee shops are prolific everywhere. I usually don't go to coffee shops themselves. But I've had students do ethnography projects in my 210 class. Uh, and one of the things that comes out, which is great applied anthropology, which would be great for uh, sort of, of planning here at GRCC to draw from, is that people of different ethnic backgrounds interact differently. And there's a tendency for people of European background to sit in pairs, quietly and have face-to-face -face individual conversations. And so you need to plan space of a nice little cafe table for that type of conversing. And people of other ethnic backgrounds have a tendency to, to aggregate together in larger groups. They tend to be a little more vocal and boisterous. And by extension, you need to organize your spaces, your recreational spaces, to suit the different sort of strategies and styles. And a coffee shop is not conducive to a collective gathering of four or five more individuals having a loud conversation. 
it's very, very conducive to a very more restricted pattern of two individuals having a polite personal conversation. And so by extension, if you habitually go to a coffee shop as your place of socializing and meeting people and interacting, you're walling yourself off from an entirely different segment of the very same city that might socialize themselves in a different community size, an aggregate size. So it's all mundane little things in these regards that have those types of effects. It was my joke, or not my joke, but um, getting ahead of myself. Um, I remember having a conversation once with my friend Jeff, um, and he lives on the northwest side. And I'm talking to Jeff, and uh, he's like explaining where he lives, and I'm like, oh, that's great. I'm like, hey, you live in the old Lithuanian neighborhood. And he's like, yeah, my neighbor's Lithuanian. How'd you know? And I'm like, I got a map. And he laughed, and everybody laughs. Um, and then I point out I have a map that depicts where the Lithuanian neighborhood in Grand Rapids in 1930 is. Um, and this is one of those relics of creating walls between groups of people that goes back to really the, the interwar period when we were doing a lot of redlining of districts. Um, there's volumes and volumes and volumes of data on neighborhoods that list the ethnic composition of neighborhoods. And what they used was those lists to selectively approve mortgages for different groups of people. And the idea was to keep some people apart from other people. Apparently, you couldn't have the Poles and the Germans living next to each other, and you had to keep the Lithuanians over here. And people of Dutch descent wanted to be elsewhere. Uh, this is the, what everybody recognizes as the black community within Grand Rapids. What I find truly amazing is that's the exact same location where the black community was in Grand Rapids in 1930. For me, what that illustrates is the power of these invisible walls, is that in 80 years, what we left with are the exact same constraining walls that each of you bump into every single day, where you go to school with, who you interact with, what stores you go to, where you go to eat, who you set up and, and give a recommendation for a job for, what street do you walk down? All of that restricts your movement. You spend all day long like a bunch of little sheep bumping into invisible walls. And the effect of that is maintaining boundaries between groups of people that are more long lasting. If we would have built a physical wall around here, it would have been down 20 years ago. Because a physical wall is something all of you can resist against and you can see and you can go around. But an invisible one, those are the ones that, unless you're aware that you're doing it and how it's affecting your life, it's not going to have any impact whatsoever on you. And you're just going to keep going through and doing your daily habits over and over and over again. So I just want to thank everybody for, uh, for fr coming to uh, my talk. I'm going to give a shameless plug for Dr. Evelyn Bloom's talk uh, later on tonight, uh, 7 to 8.30 in this room, uh, which concludes the keynote address for our race and ethnicity conference as well. Uh, thank you very much. Do we have any uh, questions for Dr. Dylan Carr? Um, Francisco Ramirez, I work at the Enrollment Center at uh, Grand Rapids Community College. So we were talking about the invisible lines, and in a way, the consensus that I got from your speech and presentation was more that it should be an individual action. All of our individual actions kind of help in, in either destroy or create these walls. Mm -hmm. But in the 50s, as you were talking about redlining, you know, when, when there were certain families that were selected for loans, and you're thinking, we're thinking 96% were selected for loans to live in the suburb area, uh, were white of or European descent. And the ones that were not selected were either color Hispanic or, Latin, or um, black African American. What do you do in that situation? In that situation, you have government structures building these walls. They're, they're negating access to these neighborhoods. Hence, that, that was the, born, the birth of suburbs. What do you do in that scenario when the individual does not have an option to make a change? Um, uh, obviously, change occurs at multiple different scales, and it occurs at multiple different paces in that regard. So, uh, 
one of the things I, I try to bring out and, and, and clarify, all of us are, are one thinker or another thinker. On one hand, people that say, well, somebody that just needs to have a little more personal responsibility and, and do something, and you place your emphasis on the personal individualized action. Well, somebody can do this, or you can do this, or if I was in their position, I would do this. Um, and those are also people that, that sort of place that emphasis on that individualistic sort of, of approach. On the other end of the spectrum are people that are more like me, which tend to focus on structural sort of issues, which I think is what your question is looking on. And so we have a tendency to say, well, what if we just engineer and create sort of laws or get some sort of, of idea of sort of top-down um, urban planning to help alleviate some of these, these things. This idea of affirmative action came down from that line. So we have historical injustices that have created these divides. So let's do this to do this. And, you know, what you end up with statistically is data that gets mixed on the effectiveness of this. Sometimes when we try doing top-down planning, we end up making situations worse. Um, other times they, they become somewhat less effective. On the other hand, if you place all of your emphasis on an individual response and say, well, as an individual, you can just go do this, you're ignoring the fact that we're all constrained by those structural forces. And so what you need to do is you need to sort of work yourself somewhere in the middle. Uh, I don't have all the top-down answers, uh, but on the, the bottom hand, uh, what I need to do is, is make individuals aware of the nuances of the structural constraints on there. And just something like this, once you're aware that there's an invisible wall affecting how you're doing things, it's easy to reach across that from both ways, either reaching across from one A to say, hey, I don't think that's right. Let's become more sort of integrated in that sense. And there's another way to say, I know where that wall is. And when you know where that wall is, you can kind of work yourself around it in that sense. Um, and so I think part of that is, is in that context in, say, the 1940s, 1950s like that, where you have an obvious structural force that is, is creating uh, sort of divides in that. Um, you saw, I think, individuals themselves doing some pretty uh, uh, ingenious ways to get around that. You have um, Idlewild uh, up in, in Baldwin, which is a great example of that. You have Auburn Hills here in, in Grand Rapids as another example of individuals that, that saw where those structural walls ended and they sort of worked themselves around it. And so I, I don't think that that would have changed any quicker or any different way because uh, I think there's this uh, more of a collective momentum at that, that time. But those same problems are affecting us today. And so I think that that's that same solution is that uh, you can't just say every individual's got to empower themselves and do it because there is structural constraints. But on the other hand, you can't go to the other extreme and say, well, we just need more bureaucrats to, to sort of set up a program to, to deal with this. So I think that really the conversation is trying to map where these boundaries are, the effectiveness of what the boundaries are, and then use that to try to figure out on the ground a much more bottom-up approach of, of getting to communities that you want to sort of, of sort of help move forward and say, what is the best way or what can I do to help you in that regard? And so uh, it can't be completely put on an individual shoulder and it can't be a completely an urban planned um, top-down approach. Um, I don't know if I answered your question in there, but hopefully that, that's, that's at least where I've settled with it. So. <laughs> well, it works, okay. Uh, Jacob Vasquez, GRCC student. Hey, you're in my class. Darn right I, I am. I need to meet you for once. Yeah, you my know. online class. How are you doing, right. Jacob? Yeah, this is what I look like. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> my question, I got to start off with a little bit of quick background. My best friends, I have a black best friend, a lesbian best friend, a half black, half white best friend, and one who's really the whitest guy you've ever met. And uh, we've kind of created, in, in our own little world, our own subgroup of you know, we all like nerd culture, comic books, because we're adults, um, and lots of other things. But I'm just wondering, in the myriad of research you've probably done, as much as it seems like the, the systemic, the structural settings, it almost seems like, is it really human nature to want to just find those people who you kind of just connect with and wall yourself off from people who don't appreciate how cool you are? <laughs> because we think we're awesome, and even though sometimes we are proven wrong, you know, we have a very set structure where we include, you know, the, the spouses and the girlfriends and family members, but for the most part, it's the main group. I think yeah, you touched upon sort of the, the main idea behind how ethnicity operates. We want to do it, and it serves a valuable role of making us feel comfortable, and so we seek after it, but then really the, the kind of the, the, I guess the message I was asked, or delivering is that that's what you're going to do. And that's what every one of us does. 
But the trick now is to realize that there are going to be unintentional consequences of that and to sort of evaluate what those are. You know, so if you go out your way and, and sort of have um, what seems to be a fairly diverse sort of group of friends united by um, nerddom or whatever, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the academic term for it would be. Uh, <laughs> apparently there's a term for it. So, um, then I, I think that you know, you're at, at the point where maybe you've seen where some of the negative sort of aspects of certain walls are and you've stepped across those. Which gets back to this question over here is, um, I don't think any central planner can ever envision the unifying factor of um, nerd, nerd culture or whatever in that regard. And so there are just weird little things that on the, the, the ground level are integrating forces in that regard. So I, I think what it is is an example of what occurs when people sort of, of um, have this idea that you know, maybe they're not going to be as constrained by, by certain boundaries themselves. But for the fundamental problem, that's what everybody one of us does, is we all have our circle of friends that we feel comfortable in. And with, whether we like it or not, we exclude everybody else. So now the, the, the question for each of you then is to take a step back and think, you know, who am I excluding? And what are really sort of the, the negative effects of my exclusionary sort of behavior? And in some cases, it might be something where it, it hits you and say, like, hey, I didn't realize I was doing this, and maybe I want to reach across that boundary a little more. In other cases, in terms of, of you and your friends, you've already reached across a lot of those boundaries. So then just keep, uh, keep, keep on keeping on, I guess. Sort of. That's an official academic term. Who gave him a microphone? Colin, what a brilliant presentation. You should have been a geographer, I'm telling you. <laughs> I have a question, though, because you, you, have, you have conducted this, I think, over a relatively brief period of time, which shows the value, really, of this analytical skill that's available in the social sciences to really resolve uh, a number of current problems. As, as you look at this and you've addressed matters associated with urban and regional planning and transportation uh, needs that can be equalized and perhaps rental housing being made available, are there any other um, needs that should be addressed, do you think, that can, that can facilitate some equality across these ethnic landscapes? You know, I'm, I'm biased because obviously I'm an educator, but I, I think school systems are um, really a, a, just such a rich um, resource. And I think that's one of the things that, that we've, we've picked up on over the years is when people do have an opportunity to um, engage in education in essentially multicultural settings, um, is that everybody benefits from that in that sense. Um, so I know you just kind of fed me a softball question with that. but. Um, and sort of leading to, because obviously I know where his mind is at, but um, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Uh, but yeah, so that's where I would personally say that um, I think you kind of get the most return uh, for your investment. And so when you look at some of these issues on a global scale in terms of, of helping out in developing countries, the biggest return on, on your dollar investment in terms of development is always girls' education. Um, and so um, here in, in the States, I think the biggest return on your dollar for for working through that is, is just education and sense, particularly at the elementary school level where, where people form social networks that, that sort of, of help transform across all the other habitual boundaries that are going to arise. But then they also have a, a way to um, think at things from multiple different perspectives um, because you're bringing so many different lived experiences into a, an educational setting. Um, and you know, for me personally, that's one of the best things about teaching here at GRCC is having taught elsewhere where you get a much more homogenous student body is class discussions get very, very stale and they peter out quickly. Um, but uh, here at GRCC, because we do have such a, a, a wonderful student body that we have wonderful, vibrant discussions, and I think everybody benefits from that. So, You talked about boundaries and in, in that, you know, there's ethnic, our ethnic identity or whatever, how we, um, how it can be a good thing for belonging and that we have unintentional consequences. But how does it fit in the, there's certain sort of groups who are vested in maintaining certain boundaries f for maybe, you know, and purposes that most of us wouldn't agree with. 
um, how, how does that fit in? Like say the, I don't know, say skinheads or something like that, you know? Um, it's pretty obvious that um, I, I think at, at some point you get the entire sort of, of again, spectrum of, of people's thought. And everybody's going to fall in there somewhere. Um, some people are going to be um, on the, the extreme multicultural end of it, that what we should do is, is have urban planning and pick every individual and put um, wonderfully uh, sort of, of randomized samples of, of individuals together. And that would be a utopian society to the other extreme where um, you obviously have uh, the very, very extreme elements uh, that um, really it, it, it doesn't even approach anywhere near a civil conversation. So clearly, I, I think um, at both extremes, uh, we can see some, some very, very difficult uh, sort of, of things that uh, I think that all the time we need to be looking towards that, that conversation more in the middle. I'm not trying to hedge my answer in that sense. When I, I try to bring this out when I talk about um, the two of the key anthropological theories of ethnocentrism and cultural relativism, is that there always has to be a tension between those two. So if, if obviously an extreme version of ethnocentrism leads to genocide, hate crimes, oppression, um, and that's something that I think all of us in this room have a, a pretty comfortable grasp on saying, well, uh, no. On the other hand, with extreme cultural relativism, then you work yourself into almost an anything goes painted corner. Um, and that in some contexts, so if you have somebody that uh, emigrates from um, a part of the world that, that has a, a legacy of having, say, a, a patriarchal sort of, of structure and that there's a degree of, of um, gender inequality that is very, very severe, uh, you know, an extreme multicultural position says, well, that's their valued position, so we need to sort of, of somehow maintain that in this, this utopian hodgepodge. And I, I would still speak out against that as well by saying that at some point, each of us have to find some sort of moral line where that is. And hopefully, uh, by having conversations with everybody that we can um, sort of, you're always going to have those conflict on those edges, but the more of us that can kind of sit in that, that, that middle there, I, I think, is, is uh, productive in that. And, and if you have people conversing across those, I think extreme elements, um, which are always harmful, um, get observed pretty quickly. And, and those kind of get marginalized pretty quickly. Um, so. It has to be in there a little bit somewhere. It has to be. But where that is, I'm not going to tell anybody. But it's got to be in there somewhere. Um, I just wanted to um, ask you about um, gentrification. And uh, as an anthropologist, you're probably aware of how on, on division there's all these um, these New York style lofts that have moved in and uh, a lot of people have been forced out of their regular uh, place where they're living and on Wealthy Street. Wealthy Street, there's been kind of a revitalization and a lot of African American businesses have uh, closed down in that area when it was predominantly African American. And when you were talking about the coffee shops, it made me think that not only is it the fact that they're a coffee shop, but there's also this division that happens where these coffee shops open and they're aimed towards a certain type of uh, white person. And uh, same thing with the bars in Grand Rapids. A lot of the bars are segregated along with the co coffee shops because I've been on trips to Kalamazoo and uh, they've said that uh, the, the different races go to the same bars and coffee shops. And I'm just wondering um, if that's a form of unconscious uh, gentrification. I would think, yeah, basically the, the process of gentrification you're describing are uh, building those walls up and making them more firm and sometimes sort of pushing the, the edges of, of where those, those particular walls are. Um, obviously, people think they're making money on it, and other people want to live in a neighborhood they feel comfortable in. Um, and so that's one of the, the sort of the dynamics that pushes um, gentrification in that regard. But we do know, and, and it, it basically illustrates kind of what I was, the, the dynamic I was talking about as well, which is um, what you end up then is, is it, gentrification becomes a, a very, very rigidly exclusionary process um, in that regard. Um, one of the best anthropological studies I saw was a case of stall gentrification um, of um, 
there was a process of gentrification in a sort of a mid-sized urban city in the East Coast of the United States. And then there was an economic downturn, which halted the process of gentrification. So then you basically had two different communities living side by side. And it was pretty insightful in the ways in which they were behaving differently in those, those types of spaces. So the people that were predominantly uh, upper middle class were driving to the suburbs to go grocery shopping, coming back home. Um, I, I do an example, and you were in class, we, we talked about the different construction of houses and the use of different parts of houses. Houses constructed today don't have front porches because nobody wants to interact with their neighbors in that sense. You drive into your garage and you create yourself a little bubble in that regard versus somebody that is going to have a much more semi-public space and spend most of their time in that semi-public space. But in that example of stalled gentrification, what you end up seeing emerging are uh, somebody of, of a, a lower socioeconomic class doesn't have a lot of, of resource options. And so what you do is you build up a street economy. You build up social connections there. And so if you need 20 bucks, you can't sort of, of put on a credit card because you don't have a credit card. But what you need to do is you need to find somebody that you can get a, an odd job from to make that quickly or um, a friend that you can borrow it from in that. So that's partly why people would use a public space in that context, whereas often what happens with gentrification is you get much more commodification of that interaction. People's homes become a little more um, sort of removed from public life, but then when people do interact, it's in that, that much more formalized space that are, are coffee shops and cafes and uh, I don't know about the bars, but uh, one of the, the most common things that come up are, are churches and, and, and sort of a worship time gets very, very uh, sort of diluted in that regard. So uh, that's a, a very good illustration of, of the dynamics we're talking about. So. I'm Tracy. I work here at the college. And I don't know if it com how we compare against other cities of our size, but a real big builder of invisible walls, I think, has been the media. Um, especially been blatant the past couple of months um, with the murders in Kentwood. I'm not minimalizing anything, but it didn't become obvious until we had six deaths and shootings in the past couple of months in the area that you were mentioning in the southeast or in the inner urban area. And then it also again happened this past couple of weeks. There's been two people that have been missing since February 14th, it's been all over the news, yet uh, a woman of five, a mother of five children go missing last week, and because of her neighborhood or her background, she's been reported once. Mm -hmm. So I think media here in Grand Rapids has really built a lot of walls. Are there any media members in the audience? <laughs> all right, then I think the media is a problem. <laughs> uh, in, in that. <laughs> In that regard, I, I agree, and that's kind of, of one of the things in terms of thinking about how you get these ideas the other when you're not, and that's, that really illustrates um, the danger of having walls. And so if you're not interacting with somebody else who is the other, whatever you're, you, whoever gets othered in, in your particular situation, um, if you don't have really any sort of interpersonal interaction with that, your opinion is only going to be formed through the media. And so, and we have a tendency to see that the media is obviously a business, and so what they want to do is, is sell papers or sell website hits or whatever they're, they're trying to sell. And so that tends has a tendency to um, fuel into stereotypical images. And so what you oftentimes see is people that, that don't have a personal experience with the other will draw upon those, those particular images as, as well. So um, I, don't, you know, I don't have any data offhand where I can talk about sort of the, the frequency of, of things, but I think that, that it's a widely recognized sort of, of dynamic or dimension that. Um, there does, does tend to be a, a very, very skewed portrayal of different social groups in, in that context. Um, you know, on both sides, it depends on if you read Fox News or the New York Times, it's going to sort of skew um, so how you, you see across those, those different boundaries. Um, if you read the New York Times, you're going to think about Republicans differently if you um, do so. And so it happens all the time in that regard. But they're trying to sell papers. And so um, it's, I agree with you 100%, basically. I, didn't have, I don't know if I had an answer to that. Okay, we got one more question before we conclude. I'm Professor Carr. Good yourself, Sean. Well, I'm well. Uh, I wanted to ask, because I'm, um, I'm actually interested in doing this type of work, uh, going into the communities and uh, building those bridges. And I'm considering going, taking the pathway of education. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know, as an educator, what could you do to help raise that awareness in the communities? What could you do uh, to the young mind, because you know a lot of people they get their perceptions and their uh, their biases, you know, from home mm -hmm. and at school. And I was wondering, you know, for the people who 
it's a lot of people who won't get to this level. Like it's a lot of people college, uh, a lot of people won't get college educated. Mm -hmm. So they might not be able to take the classes. Like I've taken your class, I've taken uh, his uh, sociology class, I've taken um, Professor Connors, I've taken race and ethnicity. So I've been able to get my mind um, challenged and I've been able to bring some of my baggage to the table and uh, be able to sharpen different facets of myself. But a lot of people might not get to this level and they might not be willing to think critically enough. So I'm wondering as a leader, as a, as a young leader, what can I do in my community and communities abroad to be able to raise that awareness? Well, it's, I think you're, you're probably on the, the right path in terms of just simply being actively thinking about it and having a passion for it. Um, the, the geography uh, sponsored roundtable um, yesterday, which was excellent, had um, a representative from, um, was it Burton School? Uh, the community um, service coordinator. So I think education is going that direction where we're seeing the need for individuals to be in those that are our liaisons between the schools and not just students, because obviously we interact with students in the classroom, but interacting with the entire family in that regard, and sort of, of making those, those types of things a lot more involved. And so the idea of a community school is, is that it's not just a place where students go to, but that what you're doing is, is um, you're not just educating a child, but you're interacting and investing in, in families in that. Um, the Loop program, which is having teachers in that following um, with a, a cohort for two straight years, to build those relationships and invest in those relationships. So I think um, at the sort of the structural level, there's a lot of really great things going on in education. So my encouragement to you would be to, as you pursue that, get involved with, with and try to, if there's a, a place that, that you uh, feel comfortable with, um, sort of, of, and they have those programs, just try to work your way into the program. If you see a community that doesn't have that program, then you, you obviously have models you can draw from. But um, I think there's a lot of really great work going on at that type of level. So follow-up question to that. Okay. Um, do you think that um, implementing uh, ethnic studies into uh, the curriculum in schools, do you think that that will have an effect on people? Um, you know, I... Because, I, I mean, I, 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 one thing that I can say is uh, I spent time in Grand Rapids Public Schools, mm -hmm. and uh, they was pretty much, you know, racially homogenous. And uh, then... Um, I went to Crest in my freshman year, and then I went. I spent my last three years in Wyoming, and the school system was more diverse. Mm -hmm. And I remember, in particular, for Black History Month, we really didn't focus on it. We didn't. I mean, we we didn't even address it at all. And it seemed like to me that it was irrelevant because of the you know the school population and and, and what they looked like, mm -hmm. and it, it it was pretty much treated as you know a second tier footnote and not as American history as a whole. Did I? That gets down to what often is referred to as blue box issues. Um, and I kind of talked about that last year in the race and ethnicity, is, is there's a tendency for us to take um, things that are outside of sort of the, the majority or mainstream. And what we do is we, we push them off in terms of, of time and place. So we only celebrate black history during Black History Month. And then the rest of the time, we can go back to white history, uh, which sort of, that, that creates problems. And so people can almost tune it out at times, which I think the, the best answer is, is kind of what Dr. DeVivo is leading towards which was if, if you can really work at, at sort of having a wonderfully diverse and integrated sort of, of school experience and the curriculum sort of fits with that is that you don't need to have, we're gonna have two weeks for this now and then what people tend to do is they tend to tune that out. So if we have ethnicity class, then everybody's gonna, I gotta take this and then you'll sort of lack that engagement with it. But when it's, it's woven all the way through because you have somebody talking, well, I'm looking at this, this history uh, book from this perspective because my family's got this background and you have somebody else, well, I just read the same book from this perspective because my family has this background. You get that woven all the way through and that's the benefit of it really. But if it's just in March we're going to do this and in April we're going to do this, then uh, really you, you sort of just keep banging your head against the wall, so to speak. So, um, Good question. So. All right. Thank you everybody for, uh, for coming and we'll get your extra credit. Thanks for moderating, Keith. <laughs>